This presentation will discuss consumption, real GDP, and the multiplier. To simplify things, let's assume that businesses pay no indirect taxes, sales tax. Businesses distribute all profits to shareholders. There is no depreciation and the economy is closed as there's no foreign trade. Real disposable income is real GDP minus net taxes or after-tax real income. Consumption is spending on new goods and services out of a household's current income. Whatever is not consumed is saved. Consumption includes such things as buying food and going to a concert. Saving is the act of not consuming all of one's current income. Whatever is not consumed out of spendable income is, by definition, saved. Saving is an action measured over time, a flow. Savings are a stock, an accumulation resulting from the act of saving in the past. Consumption goods are goods bought by households to use up, such as food and movies. Consumption plus saving is equivalent to disposable income, or saving is equivalent to disposable income minus consumption. Investment is spending by businesses on things such as machinery and buildings, which can be used to produce goods and services in the future. The investment part of real GDP is the portion that will be used in the process of producing goods in the future. Capital goods are producer durables, non-consumable goods that can firms use to make other goods. The supply of savings is determined by the rate of interest in the classical model. The higher the rate, the more people want to save and the less they want to consume. However, Keynes believed that the interest rate was not the most important factor Instead, real disposable income had more to do with it. Furthermore, a person's anticipation about future flows of income influences how much of current income is allocated to consumption and how much is allocated to saving. The life cycle theory of consumption considers how a person varies saving and consumption as income ebbs and flows throughout an entire lifespan. The theory predicts that when an individual anticipates a higher income in the future, he or she will tend to consume more and save less in the current period than would have been the case otherwise. The permanent income hypothesis suggests that the income level that matters for a person's decisions about current consumption and saving is permanent income or the average expected lifetime income. So if a person's flow of income temporarily rises without an increase in average lifetime income, the person responds by saving more and leaving consumption unchanged. Keen suggested that consumption and savings decisions primarily dependent on a household's current real disposable income. A consumption function is the relationship between the amount consumed and disposable income. A consumption function indicates how much people plan to consume at various levels of disposable income. Dissaving is a situation in which spending exceeds income and can occur when a household is able to borrow or use up existing assets. The 45 degree reference line is the line along which planned real expenditures equal real GDP per year. Autonomous consumption is the part of consumption that is independent of the level of disposable income. Changes in autonomous consumption shift the consumption function. The average propensity to consume is just real consumption divided by real disposable income, and it can be seen as the percent of disposable income that is consumed. The average propensity to save is the real savings divided by real disposable income. It can also be seen as the percent of disposable income saved. Since we must either consume or save disposable income, the average propensity to save is equivalent to 1 minus the average propensity to consume. The marginal propensity to consume is the ratio of the change in real consumption to the change in real disposable income. As an example, let's consider an income of $54,000 with consumption of $49,200 and savings of $4,800. The average propensity con to consume then is equal to the total amount of consumption, $49,200, divided by the total real income, $54,000, and is equal to 0 0.911. Since you can either consume or save, the average propensity to consume plus the average propensity to save is equivalent to 1. Likewise, the marginal propensities are also equal to 1. A change besides real disposable income will cause the consumption function to shift. Non-income determinants of consumption include population and wealth. Net wealth is the stock of assets owned by a person, household, firm, or nation, net of any debts owed. 
For a household, wealth can consist of a house, cars, personal belongings, stocks, bonds, bank accounts, and cash, minus any debts owed, like the value of your mortgage. Investments consist of expenditures on new buildings and equipment. Gross private domestic investment has been volatile. Consider the planned investment function and shifts in the function. Here we have our plan chart of total investment relative to the annual rate of interest. And here's the graph of that relationship. To determine the equilibrium level of real GDP per year, we need consumption as a function of real GDP and the 45 degree reference line. Combining them graphically, we can see their relationship. We can add the investment function, which is aggregate demand is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. Here we can combine consumption and investment. Looking at the chart in panel A and our investment schedule, we see that we plan to invest $2.8 trillion. Then, pulling this over, we can add that to our consumption, and so we get our consumption plus investment curve. However, only at equilibrium real GDP will plan saving equal actual saving. Planned investment equals actual investment, therefore planned saving is equal to planned investment. Here we see the relationship between planned savings or savings and investment. In equilibrium, we have savings equal to investment. However, since planned investment is constant and savings changes with real GDP, we can end up with gaps on either side. What about unplanned increases in business inventories? Consumers purchase fewer goods and services than anticipated. This leaves firms with unsold products and inventories will rise. Businesses respond by cutting back production and reducing employment. Conversely, with an unplanned decrease in inventories, business will increase production of goods and services and increase employment. Ultimately, there will be an increase in real GDP. Now let's consider adding in government and foreign investment. When we add government, G, into our equation for federal, state, and local, it does not include transfer payments. It's uh, autonomous and lump sum taxes equal G. Lump sum taxes are a tax that does not depend on income or the circumstances of the taxpayer. The foreign sector, or net exports, is denoted as X, and it equals exports minus imports. It depends on international economic conditions, and it's also autonomous and independent of real national income. Determining the equilibrium level of GDP per year. We're now in a position to determine the equilibrium level of real GDP per year. Remember that equilibrium always occurs when total planned real expenditures equal real GDP. Now can we create our total expenditures curve by adding investment, government spending, and net e export. Now if our total of consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports is equal to real GDP, then we're at equilibrium GDP. However, if it's greater than real GDP, we must have had unplanned decreases in inventories, businesses raise output, and Y returns to equilibrium. Conversely, if it's lower than real GDP, Unplanned increases in inventories occur, businesses reduce output, and Y returns to equilibrium. The multiplier is the ratio of the change in the equilibrium level of real national income to the change in autonomous expenditures. The number by which a change in autonomous real investment or autonomous real consumption is multiplied to get the change in the equilibrium real GDP. This chart explains the multiplier process. Here we if, if we assume that marginal propensity to consume is equal to 0.8, then with an increase in real GDP of $100 billion, we expect an annual increase in planned real consumption of $80 billion. This leads to an increase in real GDP of $80 billion, which again increases planned real consumption. And we go back and forth until that $100 increase in real GDP is expected to total $500 or $500 billion of real GDP increase. We can find the multiplier by dividing 1 by 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume or by dividing 1 by the marginal propensity to save. Clearly, the smaller the marginal propensity to save, the larger the multiplier, and conversely, the larger the MPC, the larger the multiplier. So, the change in equilibrium real GDP is equal to our multiplier times the change in autonomous spending. The effect of the multiplier means that it's possible that a relatively small change in consumption or investment can trigger a much larger change in real GDP. So far, we've only considered the case where price level remains unchanged 
and only considered aggregate demand shifts in response to investment, government spending, and net exports. Moving forward, we take into account the aggregate supply curve. We must also consider responses of the equilibrium price level to a multiplier-induced change in aggregate demand. Here we see that with a $100 billion increase in autonomous spending, we expect a $500 billion increase in real GDP per year causes a shift in aggregate demand, which then leads to a decrease in real GDP, but an increase in the price level as we move along the short run aggregate supply curve to the new intersecting point. Recall aggregate demand consists of consumption, investment, government spending, and foreign sector or net export. There's a major difference between the aggregate demand curve with price level constant and an aggregate demand curve drawn with the price level changing. To derive the aggregate demand curve from the consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports curve, we must now allow the price level to change. So how might a price level increase affect this? It affects real balance effects, interest rate effects, and open economy effects. Here we see that as this curve adjusts downward, our intersection point or equilibrium is reached by an increase in price level.